Hello, welcome to BM 6611 Managing Brands, Session 15, Branding Strategy. This is the second video relating to branding strategy. In video one, we looked at one of the important strategic tools which organisations can use to help them evaluate and plan their branding strategy, the brand product mix matrix. And we also looked at the different roles that brands can play within an organisational portfolio. In this video, we're going on to look at the second important strategic tool that can help with brand planning, and that is the brand hierarchy. This is a way of showing how brand elements are ordered hierarchically uh, across products that an organisation offers. And as a result of that, it captures the potential branding relationships between the different products sold by the firm, which have elements in common and which have different elements. And it enables the firm's branding strategy to be illustrated in a graphic manner. So let's have a look at a brand hierarchy. What does it actually mean? Brand hierarchy can involve a number of different levels. Not all of these levels will necessarily be used for every brand, but there can be this many levels in a brand hierarchy. Starting with the corporate brand. This is the highest level of the brand hierarchy. So an example would be Nestle. Nestle is a corporate brand and the Nestle brand name and brand logo appear on many, in fact, probably all of the products um, that Nestle offer, with the exception of pet food, uh, which is sold under a completely separate and marketed under a completely separate brand name, Purina because the Nestle corporate brand is not considered to be appropriate to, to show in connection with pet food, the relationship between human food and pet food not being one that we would want to necessarily stress. So the corporate brand is at the top of our brand hierarchy. What comes next? Next, we may have a family brand. So an example within the Nestle world would be Nescafe. A family brand, as the name suggests, is, an, is a brand name that's used to group together a family of related products. Underneath a family brand, we can have an individual brand name. And an example here would be Nescafe Gold Blend. So it's from Nestle, it's a Nescafe product, but it's a special kind of Nescafe that has its own individual name to identify it and to differentiate it from other Nescafe products. And underneath the individual brand, we can have the individual item or modifier, or sometimes this is referred to as the brand variant. Particular pack sizes, flavours, uh, formulations, etc. And you can see here a number of different Nescafe uh, individual product items. So in this particular example, we've got four levels of the brand hierarchy. All the possible levels are used. And so the consumer presented with these products can see if they turn around and look at the back of the packaging, they can see that they're made by Nestle. The Nestle name and the uh, company logo will be there. And so if they have tried Nestle products before, if they know about the company, they know that products that and brands that come from Nestle will be of good quality. Looking at the front, they can see clearly on all of these pictures that these are Nescafe products. Again, Nescafe is a very well-known coffee brand standing for straightforward value and reliable quality. And then for variety, Sometimes you might want a different flavour, an espresso type coffee, a more richer coffee, a decaffeinated version. And so the individual items or modifiers or brand variants provide the consumer with variety and choice, but still reassuring them of that all important Nescafe and Nestle brand promise of consistency, reliability and quality. So let's look at each level of the hierarchy now in turn, starting with the highest level, the corporate brand. Uh, the reason why 
some uh, organizations choose to show the corporate brand name alongside other family or individual brands is to provide some further reassurance as to the provenance of the product. The corporate brand name may be um, widely known and respected and it can encompass a much wider range of associations than any one individual product brand can. So Nestle, PepsiCo, Unilever, Mondelez, all manufacture a wide range of products. And so they can be known for excellence in a wide area rather than just in one particular product category. Also, promoting the corporate name, apart from giving further reassurance to the customer that the product comes from a large, reputable, well-known, well-established, uh, financially sound organisation, this also promotes the corporate name which uh, brings it further to the attention, brings its activities further to the attention of uh, consumers and, and business to business markets. And so adds further shareholder value, creates more recognition and more enhances the reputation. And as a result, um, creates more shareholder and stakeholder value for the organization. So the examples you can see on this slide, uh, KitKat, for example, showcases its owner's name, Nestle, very clearly on the packaging. Top right of your slide, you can see a packet of Oreos, biscuits or cookies. And the corporate name is shown here in a red triangular flash, top left of the packaging. It's Nabisco, which is actually part of the Mondelez uh, company. But the corporate name Nabisco is more well known, better known, has higher level of salience than Mondelez which is a relatively new uh, corporation formed by a merger. And so the Oreos continue to show Nabisco, and Nabisco is a, an operating division of Mondelez. So the corporate brand name can be used to further reassure consumers as to the quality of the, the product that they are purchasing. And bottom right on the slide, you can see Hyatt Regency, the Hyatt corporate brand name is in a larger and bolder font than Regency. Regency as a, as a brand of hotel may not partic be particularly well known, but Hyatt is. And so the Hyatt name gives reassurance. In other cases, the corporate name doesn't appear exactly alongside other brand names on the packaging. Unilever, for example, with its um, very distinctive logo towards the middle of your slide here, the Unilever logo generally appears on the back of packaging. You'd have to turn it round to have a look. Thinking now about the family brand, the next level down in our branding hierarchy. Um, as I said earlier, this is used to group together, to link a uh, related set of products. And it is not necessarily the same as the corporate name. Um, it can be used in one product category or across product categories to unify and to link and connect uh, products that an organization markets to give those products common associations. And it's a very efficient means of doing that, of linking products together and giving them these common associations. So there are a number of examples listed and shown on the slide here. The Butoni family name is used to link together uh, Italian food products such as pasta, uh, ready to use pasta sauces, grated Parmesan cheese and so on. And Butoni is owned by Nestle. One of Unilever's very successful family brands is Dove. And this group is, is a, a family brand that is used to group together a range of personal care products such as soap, deodorant, body wash, body lotion and so on. Within the world of Procter & Gamble, one of their family brands is Fairy, which is used to group together washing up liquid, dishwasher tablets and laundry detergent, all of which have a gentle uh, cleansing property rather than being super high-tech, full of chemicals, etc. So the fairy 
name and the fairy brand elements give all of these products an association of gentleness. Carrying on our journey down the brand hierarchy, we come to the individual brand. And this is something that I want you to think about in a bit more depth and detail in preparation for our class session. An individual brand is usually restricted to one product category. The previous, the preceding level, the family brand, can straddle a number of product categories and join together or group products across those product categories. The individual brand name is usually restricted to only one product category. The example I'm giving here is Perrier, one of Nestle's mineral waters. But what other examples can you think of, of individual brands that only exist within a single product category? Bring your examples to our class session. And then the final level of the brand hi hierarchy is the individual item, modifier or variant. And this gives a very clear signal to the customer that there is a difference in the brand here related to something, uh, perhaps a quality level, a flavour, specific product attributes or functions. And this um, individual item modifier or brand variant level plays a very important organising role and communicates how all the different products within a category um, are related uh, and may have the same brand name, but offer different flavours, different pack sizes, different product forms, different packaging sizes or types. And this provides the customer with variety and choice. And here's an example of the brand variants relating to Polo. We think of Polo mints, but actually there are Polo fruits, Polo gummies, Polo citrus, large Polos, small Polos, sugar-free Polos, etc. So depending on your palate and whether you want to eat sugar or have something that's sugar free, depending on the type of, of uh, sweet that you're looking for, there is a polo for you. Uh, apart from mini polos, which have been taken off the market, but there is a Facebook campaign to try to have them brought back. So here we have Kit Kat. We're used not to seeing 200 varieties of Kit Kat as people in Japan are, but actually very few. In the UK, we have fewer than 10 variants of Kit Kat, and some of those are limited editions that are only available for a certain uh, period of time and then withdrawn from the market, like orange flavour Kit Kat. So, why do we have so few Kit Kat variants in the UK? And our counterparts in Japan have over 200, and this is just a, a tiny example on the slide here of nine of the different Kit Kat brand variants that are marketed in Japan. So I'd like you to think about this in preparation for our next class session. Do some research on Kit Kat Japan and see if you can find out why there are so many different types of Kit Kat. And indeed, why Kit Kat is really a very, very different kind of product in Japan compared to other parts of the world. So there are some decisions to make then in establishing a brand hierarchy. Do you need to have one? Do you want to simply have one corporate brand and have everything that you do marketed under a single corporate brand name? That's fairly common in, for example, financial services. HSBC is a single corporate brand with very little in the way of branding, if any, below it in the hierarchy. IBM, a strong single corporate brand. Virgin, a strong corporate brand, has Virgin Media, Virgin Active underneath it, but it is the Virgin brand name that is the dominant part of the hierarchy. So there's no law that says you have to use all of the levels in the hierarchy. And in creating your brand hierarchy, you have some important decisions to make. How many levels do you actually need? 
how are the brand elements from different levels of the hierarchy going to be combined, if indeed they are going to be combined, for any one particular product? How is any one given brand element going to be linked, if it is at all, across multiple products? And how is this going to help you to create the desired brand awareness and brand image at each level? So in designing the brand hierarchy and thinking about the number of levels, the principle of simplicity uh, occurs. Employ as few levels as possible. Don't add in levels just for the sake of it. The simpler the hierarchy, the better. Levels should only be added where they have a true role to play in enhancing uh, the understanding of the product for the consumer therefore enhancing salience, helping the consumer to understand what a product is and how it relates to other products that the organisation offers. So principle of simplicity, as few levels as possible. Secondly, the principle of clarity comes into play. There must be clear logic and clear relationships of all the brand elements employed. They must be simple, straightforward, obvious and transparent. You need to decide on the level of awareness and the types of association to be created at each level. I mentioned earlier that the Nestle organisation do not use their corporate brand name for their pet food, Purina, because they don't want to create awareness and connections in the consumer's mind between Nestle's human food and Nestle pet food. So in not using the corporate brand there, they're specifically deciding that they do not want to build awareness, that on the level of awareness they do not want to create. Uh, on the other hand, with the Oreos, the Nabisco brand name was deliberately used to create awareness of the connection between Nabisco and Oreos. That's a deliberate decision. So associations that the customer has with Nabisco will transfer to, to Oreos and associations that the customer has with Oreos will transfer back to Nabisco. And hopefully these will be strong, positive associations. So the Nabisco brand, the corporate brand and the Oreo um, individual brand will be reinforcing, mutually reinforcing each other. So the principle of relevance comes into play. Using the brand hierarchy, we can create global associations that are relevant across as many individual product items as possible. So Unilever do that with Dove, creating the same global associations of caring for your skin uh, across all of the products that are sold under the Dove brand name. But also, the brand hierarchy can be used to differentiate. So the principle of differentiation is also part of using the brand hierarchy. We can link products together at one level, but differentiate them at another level uh, to identify different variants, different flavors, and so on. The principle of prominence comes into play and needs to be decided on. What will be the relative prominence of these specific brand elements from the hierarchy? Because that will affect the perceptions of how closely or distantly related products are one to another and the type of image that will be created for new products. So putting the family brand or the corporate brand very prominently on packaging makes it obvious to the customer uh, that the products are closely related. Putting it in a, a smaller place on the back of a packaging um, makes it much less prominent and allows the individual brands to stand more prominently on their own. Then we have to think about the principle of commonality. How a brand will be linked across product categories. The more common elements shared by products, the stronger the linkages. 
So perhaps we share just the brand name, the family brand name. But perhaps we also share the font, the colour, perhaps some symbols or imagery uh, used on labelling and packaging. And the more of these elements that are consistently shared across products, the stronger will be the perception that the, in the consumer's mind that they are all connected, that they all link together and the associations that they have for any one product within the, the group will transfer to the others. Now you can see here that the KitKat uh, product range is very closely related. The brand elements are used in a very, very consistent manner. We have a number of different brand variants here. We've got large sizes, small sizes, multi-packs, uh, minis for sharing, things in boxes, things in bags, things in single packs and so on and so forth. But there is much more that unifies them and connects them and ties them together than separates them. We have all the levels of the branding hierarchy being used very consistently. The Nestle and Kit Kat names appearing in the same way, in the same proportion on all the packaging. The Kit Kat name being the dominant one throughout and the Nestle being the less prominent. We have the consistent use of font and in particular this red colour which ties everything together very neatly. So it's obvious that this is a unified and integrated portfolio of closely related products. So that's all for this uh, session on branding strategy. Next time we'll be looking at uh, the, the challenges that we face when we introduce and name new products and whether we should do that by creating a completely new standalone brand or by using a brand extension. And your reading for that set for this for the next session is a paper by Aker and Joachim Stahler called The Brand Relationship Spectrum, the key to the brand architecture challenge. So make sure you read that before coming to sessions 16. For now, that's all. Goodbye.